and welcome to Tala Talks Nikki, where we break down medical concepts and make them really easy for you to understand and to retain. Today's video is a little bit different from the others because it's the second part of our 10K subscribers video. So you asked us questions and we gave you answers. In the first part of the video, we already went over five of your questions. And in this one, we're going to go over five different questions and kind of one bonus question because it's kind of more fun. So watch on and learn what you all had to ask. So question number six is another excellent question from Kanisha McDowell. Thank you, Kanisha, again. And that is, what do we care about in the golden hour? Again, another excellent concept, excellent question that we think probably deserves its own video. But right now, we're just going to break down the important points of the golden hour. The golden hour, as I'm sure you all know, is the first hour of a baby's life. And a smooth golden hour has really shown to greatly improve the baby's hospitalization course, as well as the overall outcome. We care a lot more about the golden hour in premature babies who are higher likelihood of getting IVHs and having worse developmental outcomes. Probably one of the most important aspects of the golden hour is excellent planning and communication. So the more that this is discussed, the more protocols that your unit has, the better that that first hour is going to go. Obviously, communication is incredibly important too. So communication with the parents, before the delivery, with the team during delivery, as well as with everybody after delivery. And the better the communication, the better the roles that the individuals play will be set up and the smoother that the whole golden hour will go. Now I'll go over the five most important aspects of the golden hour. The first one is delayed cord clamping. So for about 45 to 60 seconds minimally. This has been shown to decrease the incidence of IVH as well as of needing blood transfusions in the baby and really has been shown very consistently to help these micropremies. So delayed core clamping should be a part of the golden hour unless, of course, there are extraneous reasons why this can't happen. The second aspect is stimulation, or basically the smoother the baby's course within that first hour, then the better the outcome will be. There's lots of more kind of theoretical information that if the baby's head stays midline, then the chance of an IVH is decreased. So you're not kind of like affecting the blood flow to and from the brain. So generally, altogether, you just don't want to be rough with the baby. You want the baby to be positioned and as centered and as unstimulated as possible. You want the baby to be in the NICU on the respiratory support that it needs, not still working on the lines kind of three hours later. In many NICUs, the goal is to have the baby stable on respiratory support, have the lines in, have the fluids and whatever medications running with the lid closed at the incubator by hopefully 60 minutes of life. So you're hoping to get the baby completely stabilized within that golden hour. The third component is temperature regulation. We did a whole separate video on this, so go watch it. But the important thing for you to know is that you don't want the baby to become hypothermic. You don't want the baby's temperature to be less than 36.5 degrees Celsius. We know that if babies are hypothermic, they have a much higher chance of having worse outcomes as well as a higher chance of dying. So extremely important to keep the baby at the correct temperature during that first one to two hours of life. The fourth component is cardiorespiratory support. So the baby needs to be given exactly what the baby needs, not too much, not too little. If the baby is breathing really well in the delivery room, even if the baby is 25 weeks, then you don't want to give massive positive pressure breaths. That in itself can increase the incidence of BPD. If the baby is shocky, then the baby may need fluid or blood as soon as possible. If you decide to give surfactant, then that surfactant should be given as quickly and as smoothly as possible. And then again, the baby should be set up on the respiratory support that it needs, preferably as soon as possible after leaving the delivery room. And then the fifth component is the nutritional support. You really don't want these babies to get hyperglycemic and stay hyperglycemic. So what you need to do is get the lines in as quickly as possible and get those fluids running. 
If you kind of feel like the lines are going to be really difficult and it's going to take a long time before we can give IV fluids with sugar, then maybe these babies even should get a PIV in while you're kind of setting up for lines and everything. So those are basically the five big components of the golden hour. There's so much more to say on this topic. And again, we will do a whole separate video. Question number seven, again from Kanisha McDowell, excellent questions, is when would a spinal tap or lumbar puncture be needed in a neonate? The important thing that you need to understand about babies, especially preemie babies, is that they're basically immunocompromised. Their immune system is way, way weaker than older kids or adults. So really, any time a baby gets any infection, whether it's an infection in the blood or a cellulitis or a UTI, there is a much higher chance that that infection could cross the blood-brain barrier and cause meningitis. So in little babies, especially preemal babies, we're way more likely to be worried about meningitis than in an older child or an adult. But really, because I love lists, I think it's the way my brain works and it makes everybody remember things better, there are kind of six situations where you should be performing a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture on a baby. The first one is any time you have a positive blood culture. So it could be a gram positive cocci, a gram negative rod, whatever it is. If you have a positive blood culture, then nearly all of the time you do need a spinal tap to make sure that you didn't also seed the CSF. The second reason is if the baby is acting super sick, but the blood and the urine cultures are negative. So for example, the baby is really lethargic or is having a bunch of increased apneas and bradycardias. As an aside, very often when babies become septic, they become hypothermic. So they just kind of run out of energy and their temperature goes down. If a baby does have a fever, then that is a lot more likely that that baby has meningitis. So if a baby has a fever, then again, that could be in itself a good reason to perform a spinal tap. So again, going back to reason number two, if the baby is acting really sick and you have persistent abnormalities on your blood work. So for example, you have really bad leukopenia or neutropenia or your CRP is really elevated and this really feels like sepsis, but you haven't been able to get a positive blood culture. Remember that in about a third of cases, you can have a positive CSF culture. So you can diagnose meningitis even in babies that had a negative culture. So basically, if you only ever perform a CSF tap on babies that have a positive blood culture, then you are going to be missing about a third of the cases of meningitis. So again, if all the picture adds up, then be concerned enough to perform a spinal tap. Reason number three, if the infant has a seizure, then unless you have a very solid reason for why that baby does have a seizure, then you should probably tap the infant. So for example, if you have a grade four IVH or the baby has bad HIE or a structural, really weird structural abnormality of the brain, you probably don't have to tap that baby. But if out of the blue, the baby starts having a seizure, then you should probably make sure that you're not missing an infection. Number four, if the infection that you're worried about has a predilection for the brain, then you should definitely tap that baby, whether it's within the evaluation guidelines or whether you're just super concerned that this is what the baby has. So for example, if you're concerned about herpes or you're concerned about syphilis, then in both those cases, you should be tapping the CSF. Number five is, and this is really very rare, if the baby has a bad IVH. So if a preemie baby has an intraventricular hemorrhage and it's a communicating type of IVH, so the um, blood is kind of preventing the CSF from being absorbed and the cerebrospinal fluid pressure is just kind of building and building and building up within the ventricles and you basically want to try to release that pressure and you can't get the baby to a neurosurgeon in time to put a VP shunt in or, or do a reservoir or something, then you might want to tap that baby to release some of that pressure. Again, we used to do this more often. Now it's gotten a lot easier to just transfer these babies and put these reservoirs in, but you might have to tap in those situations too. 
And the sixth reason is because you are trying to diagnose a rare metabolic disease. So if the baby has very abnormal symptoms, uh, mostly neurological, so maybe seizures or lethargy or um, abnormal movements or whatever, then sometimes the only way to make a diagnosis of a one of these extremely rare metabolic, neurometabolic diseases is by getting CSF. So examples of these diseases are GLUT1 deficiency, um, cerebral folate deficiency, as well as disorders of GABA metabolism. So really very rare, and this would be under the guidance of a neurologist as well as probably a metabolic specialist. Okay, question number eight. Chrissy SK55 asked, is there an optimal time to give surfactant? Great question, Chrissy, thank you. So in a nutshell, basically, if an infant needs surfactant, then the earlier you give it, the better it is for the baby. The problem, as I'm sure you've all figured out, is that when can you be absolutely sure that a baby needs surfactant? And if you always give it very quickly, then you're probably jumping the gun and giving surfactant to a bunch of babies that don't necessarily need it. A Cochrane review initially published in 2012 showed that in intubated premature babies, if they were given surfactant at less than two hours after intubation versus above two hours, then those babies had decreased incidence of BPD and death, as well as decreased air leaks. So decreased pneumothoraces and decreased pneumomineastinum and PIE and everything. Similar results to this were shown in a European study in premature infants less than 30 weeks. So once they're intubated, the earlier you give the surfactant, the better it is for the baby. If the baby is not intubated, then obviously the decision becomes a little harder. So for example, some studies have shown that having a lower threshold to give the surfactant is better for babies from a BPD standpoint, as well as from an air leak standpoint, than waiting for the baby to get a bit sicker. So studies have shown that giving the surfactant when the baby is needing 35 to 45% FiO2 is better than waiting for the FiO2 to get beyond 45%. And then again, if a baby is being transported to a higher level of care, then it's also better for that baby to get surfactant before transport is done. So whether the team at the outside hospital can give the surfactant or when the transport team arrives for them to give surfactant, then those babies will do better. They'll need less oxygen during the transport itself. And when they arrive at the new hospital, they'll need ventilatory support. So again, the earlier the surfactant, the better. As an aside, it's going to be interesting to see what happens as all these less invasive forms of surfactant administration start becoming more and more commonplace. So it's possible that the requirements that we use to give the surfactant change again. But for now, generally, the earlier the better, if the baby needs it. Question number nine is from Meredith, who asked, when does a baby need a exchange transfusion and can you describe the process? So. Luckily for us and for you, we already did a video on a double volume exchange transfusion, so go watch that. But we really didn't go into great detail about exactly when it should be done. One neonatologist I know always jokes that their level for doing an exchange transfusion is a bilirubin exactly two above the baby's current bilirubin level. And even though he says this jokingly, there really is a kernel of truth in that. If you watch the double volume exchange transfusion video, you'll know that this is not an easy procedure. It takes a lot of time. You need access. It requires the baby to receive a lot of blood products. It is, requires a lot of expertise from the blood bank to reconstitute the packed red blood cells with the plasma. And there's also a lot of potential for side effects. The baby can have really dangerous and bad electrolyte shifts. The baby can end up with hypertension. It can have an allergic reaction to the blood products. There's even an increased incidence of neck. So this is not something that we take lightly. Basically though, if the bilirubin level in your neonate is in or above the high risk zone and is continuing to climb despite your best efforts, despite your best efforts, that's the key thing. You don't just get a baby with a slightly high bilirubin and then call it. So despite your best efforts, the bilirubin continues to rise, then at that point you should perform an exchange transfusion. Like many things in neonatology, it's not really just one isolated number that's going to cause a disease. Generally, we know that the bilirubin has to stay really high for a long period of time to cause connectorus. So having one value above 20 is not gonna cause connectorus. 
Whereas if you're really worried that that number is going to stay elevated above 20 for a long period of time, then yes, you should be doing something. So for example, a baby comes in, a term newborn comes in from home at like two days of life and has a bilirubin of 25. You don't automatically do an exchange transfusion. You'll do everything else first. You'll give IV fluids and you'll put the baby under phototherapy and you'll encourage feeding and you'll follow that bilirubin serially, hoping that it will go down by itself. Or an infant has ABO incompatibility and has a bilirubin of 19 at 24 hours of life. Again, you'll give IV fluids, you'll give IVIG, you'll do everything that you can to get that bilirubin down before doing the exchange transfusion. So really an exchange transfusion is the last resort and you're doing it when you're pretty sure that the number is continuing to rise even though you're trying everything else very aggressively. And question number 10 is from Leslie. Again, thank you so much, Leslie. And the question is, what is the major reason why an administration of vitamin K is given to a newborn? Also, which babies are at greater risk of complication if the administration is declined? Thank you, and I'll get to that right now. So as you know, vitamin K is an intramuscular injection that is given to prevent hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, or that's what it used to be called. Now we know that it's vitamin K deficiency bleeding, or what we now uh, use the acronym VKDB. As you all know, vitamin K is needed to make many of the clotting factors, specifically 10, 9, 7, and 2. Remember that with 1972. And babies don't get a lot of vitamin K from their mothers and they don't have enough of the good bacteria in their gut to be able to make vitamin K themselves. So really babies are very vitamin K deficient. Giving vitamin K after birth has been shown to decrease any amount of bleeding in the first week of life or what's called classic VKDB. And this was most clearly shown in babies that were getting circumcised. Late onset VKDB presents between one week and six months of life. And normally that presents with intracranial bleeds or bleeds inside the head. And normally these bleeds can happen without any preceding major trauma. So it's not like these babies kind of were unfortunately, you know, not part of shaken baby syndrome or they didn't fall off a sofa or a bed or anything. It can be with something very minor. And very often these babies can present with seizures because they have bleeds in their brains. And to answer Leslie's second question, the breastfed infants are at greater risk of having VKDB because in a lot of formulas, a small amount of vitamin K is actually added, whereas babies really aren't getting anything from breast milk. So definitely breastfed babies whose mothers declined the vitamin K um, administration at birth are at the greatest risk of having brain bleeds from VKDB. The AAP recently reiterated its position on giving vitamin K after birth and just really emphasized its importance. And that link is below. And question 11, this is kind of a bonus question um, because we all really enjoyed talking about it and answering it um, in rounds and in the NICU. And this question is from Jo. So thank you so much, Jo, for asking this. But her question was, what's the most important impressive development or change in practice that you've seen during your time in the NICU. Okay, Joe, so kind of four things kept coming up over and over again. So first of all, since you don't know this about me, I graduated from my pediatrics residency in 2005 and started my NICU fellowship immediately. So really I've been in the NICU for about 17 years. And for me, and this came up with a lot of people, the main thing that's changed is how we give ventilatory support. So when I was first in residency and fellowship, most of these babies are, were spending long periods of time on the ventilator. So now really most of these babies are on CPAP or some other non-invasive form of ventilatory support. So whether it's NIPPV or whether they're on high flow. Also the way that we're giving surfactant, we give a lot more in and out surfactant now. And also these newer ways of giving surfactant in a very uninvasive way. So I think altogether the um, way that we're giving ventilatory support. Unfortunately, it's not really translating to decreased BPD, 
because we've also gotten so much better at keeping these babies alive. The second thing that kind of flows from there is how young the babies are that we're now resuscitating. So when I was in residency fellowship, we would pretty much routinely resuscitate 24 weekers if the families wanted it. But the 23 weekers, mostly we were providing comfort care unless the families were incredibly insistent. 22 weeks, we weren't even offering resuscitation to. Other people I spoke to, those numbers were even higher, kind of 25, 26 weeks. Now, all our attempts at resuscitation have kind of fallen by a week or two. And now we're pretty much resuscitating most 22 weekers that are delivering. The third big change that came up is, and this was kind of like a little bit before my time, but I saw its huge effects. And that is the incredible benefits of inhaled nitric oxide. So, so many of these babies with meconium aspiration syndrome or um, persistent pulmonary hypertension ended up on ECMO. And really, INO has completely revolutionized that. I mean, we so rarely put meconium aspiration syndrome babies on ECMO now. And normally it, we can really get these babies weaned kind of much more rapidly on their ventilatory support just because of the availability of INO. And the fourth big change is the huge improvements we made in nutrition. Nutritional support all over. Our TPN has really improved. The fat component that we're using has really improved. Even all the kind of like micro um, nutrients and the different additives that we're using ha have improved. Also, the actual way that we're fortifying feeds, how much more aggressive we are with fortifying feeds and making sure that these babies grow has really improved in like the last decade or so. Even when I was in residency and fellowship, we had a lot more babies that we'd randomly be getting an x-ray um, to check their lungs and we'd see that they had a fracture or they just had really, really bad osteopenia because we just weren't able to give them enough calcium and phosphorus. We hardly see osteopenia prematurity now with those ALK fossas above a thousand anymore, just because we are so much better at giving these babies nutrition. And a lot of that is because we're so aware that good nutrition and following those growth curves really improves the neurodevelopmental outcomes. Okay, well, thank you so much for asking all those brilliant questions. We really enjoy chatting about it and answering them for you. If you haven't subscribed and you're interested, then please remember to subscribe. Otherwise, please like this video. And again, thank you so much for being here.